In today's video, I'm going to do something uh, very different. A lot of you guys seem to really like the uh, conceptual type videos. Um, the last one I did on the meta, meta analysis did very well. So I have a little cheat sheet here of an outline that I wrote down for just some general tips that basically everyone can do no matter what deck that you're playing uh, in order to improve at the game. If you're, you know, your heart's stuck somewhere, I think these things should really help you out. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, not making the first move. So if you'll watch um, pretty much any like high rank play, no one does anything really until their magic is basically at 10. And the reason for that is, is if you play a card, like let's say you play, let's just say for example, I played my uh, time yeah, turner first. Um, my opponent could then easily incendio both of us at the same time. So they would, not only would they get the damage on my future copy, but they get the damage on myself. And so basically, um, they're, you know, uh, accomplishing two goals at once, which is lowering my health and answering my board state. So that's why you'll see people just stand around at the beginning. They won't play companion cards. They won't do anything. They won't move because um, whoever makes the first play can be at a disadvantage to getting outplayed by an opponent's answer that might cost less than the card that they just played, which means that their counter push is going to be bigger um, than you know what you have the mana to respond to. So um, let's see. I'm trying to think of another uh, example of this. Maybe like you throw it an Antipodian Opali. And it's your first play you did, and then they Crucio it, or maybe they just use Incendio again and hit you and the Opali. The Opali almost dies, and you take more damage than the Opali did to them before their basic attack kills the Opali. So that's the very first thing: is try not to make the first move. Now. If both people are thinking that, then you might wonder how to proceed. So the best one of the best things you can do is play a card like Niffler, Niffler. play a card like Nebulous, Nebula. because they only cost two magic, so they're very low commitment. So that way your opponent can't really punish you for cycling those cards, but you'll still get a benefit from them. So a card like Niffler, for example, um, your opponent might feel pressured to answer because you know, they don't want you uh, to be ramping. They don't want that threat out there. Um, perhaps it's Bombastic Bombs. Perhaps it's a Centaur. Perhaps it's a, a Monster Book. You just want a low uh, magic play that uh, will warrant an answer from the opponent. And the easiest way to do that is obviously a cheap summonable. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty easy. Um, another thing you could do, Swelling something like Swelling Solution would be completely fine. So now I've increased my movement speed my attack speed, and even just with the Swelling Solution, for example, I could run up on my opponent and give them basic attacks faster than they could give me basic attacks because I'm swelled and they aren't. Um, another card that would be really easy something like Expulso. Expulso. So you just poke them for a little bit of damage, and they can't really punish you for it, so why not? So that's why it's really, really important to have a cheap cycle card in your deck. So uh, first little section of the video, is don't make the first move if you can help it. And if you do make the first move, make sure it's not committal. It's very low impact. You get some kind of benefit from it, and your opponent will then be pressured to spend more than what you spent. So then you're already in a position of having more magic than they do, which means you can set up bigger counter pushes. You can start applying more pressure than they can deal with. And that's how you build up tempo throughout the course of the game. And um, eventually, it's going to lead to a big enough push that you know you end up closing the game up. The next thing I wanted to talk about is predicting your opponent's uh, movement and behavior. So, um, over the course of your games, you're going to recognize that certain people have a tendency of moving right when they get attacked, moving left when they get attacked, moving back, moving forward. And so, if you just keep track of those type of things, then um, you can punish your opponents a lot harder. For example, like this is an incendio. But like, let's say it was, if I know they have a tendency to run down the map, then I could place it like right here and do more damage as they try and use their typical escape route and go that way. Now, where it gets more complicated is once opponents know that you're going to be looking for these type of things, they're going to mix it up and then it just becomes, you know, read based or 50 50, or that might even be a, a chance where you'd want to almost just put it in the middle and just get what you can get. 
Um, another important thing is with uh, some of the cards like Expulsio, uh, Expulso, um, because of Orb of Water and Crucio and the way that it's able to um, basically knock them out of the animation and um, you know break the spell, is predicting where they're going to go is super important. But another important thing is is uh, summon. So let's say um, I put these two guys over my opponent. Now I know that they're a lot more likely to run like towards me and down or like diagonally at the you know top right corner of the map. And so now my options for where I'm gonna put the spell have been a lot more limited. So if I think they're gonna run this way, I'd put my time turner over here. If I thought they were gonna run for all the way in this corner, I could do this and I could even start waiting until they commit to a direction, then play my time turner. Then if they do, um, like let's say they move to the top right and then they change their mind because they see my time turner, now they've wasted two movement cards, which is also another resource that you can harp on by making plays like that. So you can sort of, kind of create these boundaries with your summonables, which then can make it easier to predict your opponent and kind of uh, like herd them where you want them to go and then um, provide more threats where you think they're gonna go and then force them to move even more, which is uh, really, really important. So um, thinking about your opponent's previous behavior, um, recognizing their viable options for movement, Thinking about those things, uh, it'll just it'll help you tremendously, and um, it'll help you place your spells a lot better. The next thing I wanted to talk about is your summon placement. So, let's say the game just started and you have a Niffler in your hand, and you're doing what I said you should do. If you if neither person is committing and you want to put a Niffler out there, put the Niffler on the board, Niffler. and then go ahead and just use a movement card and step away. So that way your opponent's not getting a two for one with Incendio, a Venom, Atmosphere Charm, um, whatever whatever the, the case may be for the answer. Um, and place your summonables on different sides of the centaur. board. So like there's a Centaur, there's this, maybe Thunderbird. Thunderbird over here, move away. You're trying to spread out so your opponent doesn't get value out of their spells for just like trading up on your summonables and doing damage on you. That's just not something that you want. And the, also another thing you can do is put your uh, big summons in the That's back. Podian so by the time they get to where your opponent is, you have more magic so you can respond to their response. Let's say I play the Antipodian Opali, but I played it way back here. And by the time it gets up here, I have more magic to maybe play a card and cycle to an Expulso so I can answer the Crucio that would be the perfect answer to my Antipodian Opali. And this applies a lot more the later the game goes on because uh, your magic will regenerate faster towards the end so you can cycle faster uh, through your deck. So just be mindful about where you place your summons and that also goes you for mine? your companion you cards as well. Your um, giving your opponent that much value, it's just a easy way to um, start losing from the very beginning of the game. That's why you'll see people put Lottie way in the back, uh, Kevin way in the back, um, you know, a lot of the stationary ones just in the back and then you try and take the attention off of them and uh, just make your opponent work for it and hopefully they overextend on your summons and your companions. The next thing that I wanted to talk about is a concept I'm just going to call body blocking. So there's going to be a lot of points in every match where it's beneficial for you to take damage or it's beneficial for your summon or Hermione to take, or not Hermione, your companion to take damage. And the the reason for that is is sometimes you'll take damage to protect the summonable or companion to make a bigger push or protect your strategy. And then other times when you're low, you're gonna want those things to take damage for you. So maybe you can cycle back to a particular answer. Um, maybe you're just that low in health and you need to distract your opponent. Uh, there's a lot of different things that have been going on, but like an easy example would be um, playing Brilliant. Hermione, Just another and time. let's say um, Hermione has used uh, your first copy. Well, she's not going to be good to use another spell in, for 10 seconds. So it would be beneficial to get in front of Hermione and uh, make sure she lives another 10 seconds so that way you can get off another uh, you know, major spell. So that's a really, really easy example, but the damage that I would take in the meantime would be nowhere near as um, potent as the damage that I could get if Hermione did have uh, the opportunity to copy another spell. Um, another example of this would be like maybe protecting Kevin, um, Alati, um, 
maybe like you have the the Malfoy gang and you're body blocking for them because once one of them dies, then they all go. And so it can be beneficial for you to take a bunch of damage because you'll be dishing out more damage than uh, than you're getting. Uh, another thing you can do is um, like with the loco statues, I like to put them out a lot in front of me, maybe while I'm getting swarmed, so they can take the damage um, while I uh, basic attack them, their summons or companions down, and then uh, start the counter push after that. So um, there's just a lot of scenarios where um, taking the damage is much better long term uh, to create those counter pushes. The next thing I wanted to talk about is overextending. So what a lot of people will do, especially if they smell uh, blood in the water, is they'll just like, just start popping off, right? So the problem with this is if I just did something even similar to that, and my opponent had a Cassandra, for example, I wouldn't have the magic to counterplay the Cassandra and my whole push would be just completely evaporated. Um, another example would be like, let's say I use like, let's say I do something like this. Then my opponent plays uh, Norwegian Ridgeback or something like that. Now I don't have the resources to challenge it and it's going to come out and destroy my wave anyway. Um, so there's just a lot of situations where you have to um, have magic in reserve and just kind of like tame yourself. Otherwise you can get punished really hard by a lot of plays in the game. Um, another reason why you wouldn't want to overextend is like, let's say, you know, you're just throwing a bunch of stuff out. Your opponent can get a lot of value with their AOE spells. Um, they can get a lot of value with like Confringo, Incendio, uh, Venom. Uh, everyone plays Ron pretty much. So, um, and if you haven't, especially if you haven't seen them play Ron yet, and you know there's a good chance that they do, like you don't want to just keep, you know, Magical. just making it more and more value for them. So overextending is a, is, a, is a big issue because you limit your own options and you make it a lot easier for your opponent to um, answer those things effectively. And while your opponent might take more damage in the short term, the counter push that they're going to be able to bring back to you is just going to be way more painful than whatever it was that you just did to them. So just be mindful about your opponent's options and uh, make sure that you don't overextend on the board too much, especially when there's certain companions that um, can really punish you. Like, for example, if you're really far behind and um, your opponent's on, like, their second companion card and you haven't seen it yet, if you play something like an Antipodian Opali and they've got an Ivy, they basically just snatched away six magic from you. And that could be, that could be grounds for the beginning of a huge counter push. So um, overextension is just keep it in mind. Another thing I wanted to talk about is, um, in a lot of my decks, I like to have some form of direct damage. So that could be um, Expulso. Oh, I didn't realize I could upgrade this. I want to do this real quick because it's in like every deck I have. <laughs> um, it could be Expulso. It could be Incendio. It could be a Venom. It could be an Atmosphere Charm. Um, Crucio. Um, Orb of Water, it could be a, a few different things, but I like, typically I like Incendio and uh, Expulso because they're, they're very versatile and uh, both hit ground and air units. But the reason for that is, is um, let's say your opponent is behind a wall of summons, let's say they're, um, they, they just have a good counterplay to what you're trying to do. Like let's say, let's say your deck is pre pre uh, predominantly summon cards and they've got Confringos and they've got Sectum Sempra, they've got maybe their own Venom, or you need another way of uh, getting some direct damage in. So if you incorporate just a few cards in your deck that can accomplish that, then um, you can switch your plan once they're about like 20% health to a burn plan, and you can even um, almost like ignore what's happening in the game uh, for the next, uh, you know, let's say 10 seconds or so, and close out the game. So um, there's a lot of my videos where my opponent's low and they summon like locomotor statues and I'll just start running around the board using my last bit of like movement while I sit there and I'm like expulso, expulso. copy expulso. expulso. And you know, I end up just closing the game that way, you know, with that kind of combination or like incendio, copy incendio and so on. So 
if your deck is able to have uh, the flexibility of having um, some direct burn damage, I think that um, it's definitely not a bad idea and can help you close out a lot of games. The next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, trading up. And what I mean by that is using less magic than your opponent uh, to answer whatever they did. So that way um, you end up with um, plusing magic, which is basically like in traditional card games, which is like getting a plus one or a plus two and uh, super important. And that's how you develop bigger counter pushes. So for example, on this very first page, there's three really, really efficient answers to a lot of problems. So uh, broomstick, for example, since it um, basically gets you out of this situation that you're in by, by moving you around the map, you can dodge most of incendio damage. You can um, basically dodge a plethora of spells, including Whizbang, um, which is uh, just super, super crazy because it costs seven, even if they have it um, uh, reduced by Hermione to costing four. If you broomstick out of the way, you've still plus twoed. Um, it's, uh, it's really great. Also, um, following, um, like your opponent has summonables, the summonables will follow you around not knowing that you're going to come back right to where you were, and that could buy you a few uh, precious seconds that you need. Same thing, uh, Nebulous is a great way of hiding from Thunderstorm. We all know that. And so if your opponent Thunderstorms and you're able to effectively hide in your Nebulous, uh, nullifying a lot of the damage that you're going to take, you can hide from summons while you, while you uh, gain some magic back so you can cycle to your answer. It's just super huge. Um, Expulso is great for getting people out of Orb of Water, getting people out of Crucio. Uh, you can interrupt in a Pipski, uh, for example. A lot of different things, and you just net a ton of value. Um, using AoE spells like Incendio, like Venom, for hitting multiple summons in your opponent is just great value. Um, I'm trying to think of some more like specific examples. I wrote some down. Um, it's not a huge, huge uh, plus, but Crucio and Antipodian Opali is really good because it can take down a level 18 Antipodian Opali, which I uh, did on my stream last night with Crucio, and it stuns it the whole time, so that way you don't even get hit um, a single time, so that's just a plus one. Uh, Confringo, hitting multiple summons and companions, dealing a lot of damage, if not killing everything on the board. Uh, super huge. So there's a lot of ways in the game. Uh, Expulso uh, can get rid of Pixies, which if they're the same level anyway, um, so you plus one there. Um, there's a lot of things you can do. Another thing I like to do is uh, a Pugno and copying a Pugno, and it will cycle two cards for five, and then it can really, really melt down um, either a large summonable or multiple summonables. So there's a lot of things you can do um, to trade up and you want to make sure that your deck has these types of options in them so that way you can get ahead in magic. The next thing I wanted to talk about is out cycling your opponent's answers. So if you take a look at this Snape deck, um, the average elixir cost is three, which is very low. So um, let's just say the Loco statues were actually Antipodian Opali and I know my opponent, maybe they have one good or solid answer for it. But if my cycle is lower and I know this, then I can abuse that by cycling through the cards in my deck to get to that card faster than my opponent can get back to their answer and it can put in a ton of work. I've been caught uh, taking so much damage from air units if I don't have enough air counters in my deck, especially from Antipodian Opali. And um, I mean, it can just completely uh, blow an entire game out of the water and that's why it's so important to have a low cycle because you can punish stuff like that now with my snape deck for example um i'll with the, the niffler i'll psycho to the loco statues so that way um i have just two giant bodies that can sit there and absorb the damage from thunderstorm and the niffler also helps me get back there and so that's why i added the nebulous to the deck as well because between nebulous and cycling to the loco statues um i have a lot of shock absorption or the thunderstorm. So um, just keep in mind to keep your cycles as low as you can, and then keep track of the answers your opponent has, and then maybe you can outcycle them and just uh, cause them a lot of pain for not being able to get back to their answer soon enough. The last thing that I wanted to mention is don't be afraid to experiment around with your deck. It doesn't matter if you lose a couple of games. 
Um, if you just go back and you watch my first Nate video to the current deck iteration, I've changed the deck like three or four times and every time I do, it gets better. My understanding of Snape gets better. My understanding of the game gets better. And um, it, I mean, it's just gonna make you better. So um, I think I tried baby mana cores in this deck. Um, I've tried it with and without uh, swelling solution. I've tried it with and without the copy spell. Um, I've tried it with and without Crucio. I've tried Incendio. I've tried Confringo instead. A lot of different things. And um, you're only uh, hurting yourself by not constantly changing uh, your decks and trying to figure out what the best thing to do is. And also, um, something a strategy that's working out great in Platinum might be terrible in Diamond, might be terrible in Grandmaster, might be terrible in Magic Awaken. And um, that's because your opponents are going to get better, and they're also adapting to the game um, as you are. So... Uh, for example, low ladder, you might not see that many ivies, but you do um, like mid-high ladder. Um, so that you're just going to run into cards that you're not seeing and st even strategies that you're not seeing as much. Like I almost never saw a Harry. I don't think I did see a Harry Echo until I was like 8,000 plus. Um, so you're going to have to adjust your deck and just don't be afraid to do it because um, you'll thank yourself long term. All right, so with all that being said, um, I hope you guys found something uh, informational and useful. And um, again, I just want to thank all you guys for all your support. Channel is growing like crazy. I'm still in disbelief. Um, you guys seem to like the conceptual video, so if you if you did like it, um, you know, please uh, show it in some kind of uh, tangible way uh, with a comment or a like, even a, a sub. I would greatly appreciate it. And I am going to be streaming today at uh, 6.30 p.m. So, you know, feel free to come check that out. And I'll see you guys tomorrow.